This is verdict day, judgment day after five weeks of testimony from the prosecution and an extraordinary open confession from the defendant. It comes down to Yahweh's pronouncement. Prophet Nathan serves as Yahweh's spokesman to render the decision. So let me turn it over to Prophet Nathan for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, Yahweh has reached his decision, a decision that I remind you, if you need to be reminded, is irrevocable and complete and decisive and eternal in weight and in scope. There will be no appeal to another court and there will be no accusation of unfairness in his holy justice. Once Yahweh's decision is made, judgment is final. May the accused stand. In the case of King David, the irresponsible, King David, the coveter, King David, the taker, King David, the adulterer, King David, the murderer, King David, the deceiver, Yahweh's decision from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David, the Lord has put away your sin. You will not die. Yahweh has pronounced you not guilty. So let it be written, so let it be done, now and forever. This court is adjourned. I will never forget that day. It was as if yesterday when that happened, Yahweh's declaration of me as not guilty. A flood of relief swept over my spirit and my flesh, and tears of joy cascaded down my cheeks. It is through blinding tears that that declaration resonated in my conscience, not guilty to one who was very much guilty of these sins. A heavy weight dropped from my shoulders that day. When you hear the judge of heaven declare to someone who is guilty in their tracks, not guilty, you are free to go. Freedom from any and all condemnation the rest of your life. For me, life suddenly had new meaning. Birds chirped better that day. Grass was greener and sweeter that day. The skies were bluer that day. You are free from the constant pressure of charges against you, free to begin a new life. And as I contemplated that day what I have done to Yahweh and to my own integrity, and more importantly, what God did for me that day, I did what I always do. I took up my pen and I wrote an official announcement of my own testimony on the matter upon hearing this decision, a decision you had just heard that I heard from Nathan. God did not count my sins against me. When I heard that, I wanted the whole world to know what God did for me. And so I took up my pen and I wrote down my thoughts, my testimonies. That became what you know as Psalm 32. I wrote as a response of my declaration of innocence in the sin of Bathsheba and the case versus Yahweh. I wanted that testimony to be in public record because I wanted all Israel to sing it as a hymn in corporate worship now and forever, always to be reminded of the power of God's forgiveness on a man who did not deserve it and who was charged and by my own admission is sinned. You'll find my testimony in Psalm 32 if you like to turn there. I began with basically the Old Testament's version of the Beatitudes. 
Blessed, blessed, and three blessed. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, many in Israel thought I was blessed. They thought I was blessed because I wore a crown on my head and a scepter in my hands. But you know, the man in worst poverty, the poorest peasant in my kingdom, could be just as blessed, if not more, than I was. Others thought because I had a stellar military career and was perfect on the field of battle that I was somehow more blessed. But someone who lived a defeated, broken life in Israel could be just as blessed, if not more, than I. Others thought because I had perpetual, ongoing health that somehow I was blessed of God. But people who had been broken in health but strong in spirit were just as blessed as I. People would come to the palace and remark of the royal library and the scrolls of scrolls of poetry that I wrote and the ancient books that were collected and they thought, surely this man is very wise and blessed of God, but someone in my kingdom that was illiterate could be just as blessed of God. And of course, human nature being what it is, we have a tendency to look to someone else and think they are more blessed than we are because of possessions or relationships or status. But I'm here to say in my royal testimony in Psalm 32, you know what a happy man looks like? You know what a blessed man looks like? I'll tell you what a blessed man looks like. Happy is the man whose wrongdoing has been lifted and removed. Happy is the man whose trespasses against the Lord God have been pummeled out of existence because of his declaration. Happy is the man whose moral perversity has been blotted out and canceled, never to use against him again. You will know what blessing looks like? Total and complete forgiveness by God. That is a blessed man and a blessed woman. Like blood covered on the mercy seat, God has covered my sin. Blessed is the man who the Lord has canceled his transgression. Verse 2, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. This beautiful act of forgiveness, man cannot help me do. Angels could not be called upon to assist me in pardoning. Guardian angels and archangels were impotent in cleansing me of sin. The bright moon that shines in brilliance in the night sky with its brightness could not brighten up my spirit in sin. The spring floodwaters that overflow river banks could not overflow my heart and purify it. The hurricane-like gall blast of winds could not blow away my sin. One and only one person could give me complete forgiveness, the Most High God. And by His pronouncement, not by my effort, by His pronouncement, the Lord cancels your sin, David. I am completely forgiven. I stand in His Word. I stand in His work that I am forgiven. And I know because of this, there is a day coming on God's calendar sooner today than yesterday, where I will stand before the bar of God to be judged for everything I have done or said or thought in this life. But let me tell you something today, that judgment is mine. And I will give up the ghost and breathe my last and die and go to the river of life and be washed of the dirt of earth in death. But death is mine, and I do not fear it. And soon and very soon, after I'm washed of the dirt of earth, I will be given a new body, a resurrected body. And that resurrection is mine. And I will inhabit 
the city of God, whose maker and builder is God, with its jasper walls, its azure light, its pearly gates, its golden streets, and its thousands of thousands of elements that defy all human comprehension, and that heaven is mine. The name there is mine. The airship is mine. The sonship is mine. The authority is mine. The rulership over angels is mine. It's all mine because forgiveness is mine. And I am completely pardoned of all sin and given access to this God who pronounced me forgiven. Now, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through all my groaning all day long, day and night, his hand was heavy on me. My strength dried up like the drought in summer, Selah. When I was under sin, I don't know if you've had this happen to you, but as king, I certainly was was powerless to defeat this. When I held on to my sin, something happened to me. I began to grow old right in front of my eyes. When I held on to sin and the guilt that it ridden in my body, my soul began to waste away. I would get up in the morning and I would have wrinkles almost appearing overnight. I would go to bed and wake up the next morning grayer than when I went to bed. My body creaked like the wood floors in your house. My body groaned all day and night under the stress and the anxiety of the sin that I tried to keep from others. And you know what I did? I tried to make excuses for it for a season, why I was justified in doing what I did. I tried to distract myself with the work of the king so I wouldn't have to think about it, but none of that worked. It dogged me night and day, and my body and soul began to waste away like drought in the summertime. And it was only when I confessed my sin and acknowledged it that I finally got relief. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Three descriptions I write here of what sin is and three works of forgiveness I write here. So it's poetic by design. God forgave all my iniquity. Let everyone take me as a lesson in both sin, confession of sin, and forgiveness of sin. Let everyone who is godly look at me as exhibit A and offer prayers to God at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they will not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. All that to say, I'm a military man, and I know what fear in battle looks like, but there is no safer place being in the presence of God when you're forgiven. There is no safer place in this world than being blessed and at peace in your conscience. The whole world can be shutting down against us, My whole world can be waging war and all sorts of trials against us, but to have my spirit at total peace because I'm at right with God, there is blessed living. There is happiness. And because of this forgiveness, I will now instruct you, the Lord says to me, and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye on you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. The Lord used in my life a valuable lesson that he uses in all those who he forgives. And he doesn't want us to be like a beast of the field 
that has to have a bridle in its mouth, mouth and cajoled and controlled to do what, uh, what, it, what the master wants it to do. Rather, our God wants to teach us these lessons of forgiveness so we live freely in him, like a mother who teaches her child to walk for the first time. She never lets her eyes off of that child. So our God is just as tender toward his people and never lets his eye off me. Can you imagine that? In my acknowledgement and testimony of blessing of the forgiveness today of Psalm 32, I would not be able to write this psalm to you today if God treated me like King Saul. But I'm here today to say that my God never let his eyes off of me. Like a tender mother watching her child walk for the first time and that child teeters and totters and maybe fall only for it to be picked up by the mother. So my God never let me out of his sight even in my sin, but picked me up and taught me these lessons. Now, like a child that got burned when it was young, always is tentative about fire the rest of their life, I promise you, I will never sin this way ever again. I have learned my lesson and I will not go down this path again. This sin is like a fire to a child. I won't get close to it. I won't be tempted by it ever again. I will be repulsed by it because of what it did to me and my God. And I thank God for these lessons in my life to teach me not to sin this way ever again. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. And so now, as I close this hymn to be sung in corporate worship, I ask all of those who have been pardoned to join me in shouts of joy. Notice now I make it corporate to all of you who have sinned and been forgiven of sin. Really, there's only one thing we can do, and that is shout hallelujah. I shouted in anger over the story of Nathan when he told me about the rich man. I shouted in contempt of the injustice of that rich man. And then... When Nathan turned to me and said, you are the man, I shouted in pain. Now, in God's forgiveness, I stand here before you and I shout in joy. I am forgiven. My sin is forgotten. And it is forever. Outside of heaven, there is no greater joy than being forgiven. And someday, beloved, you will join me as we, the redeemed, sing night and day to a lamb who was slain. That is his credential, a slain lamb for our sin. And you will join me soon and very soon wearing a garment. And it's not just any garment. You know what that garment is. It is a garment blood washed by the Lamb. We are reminded forever that we're only citizens of heaven because he has looked at each one of us and said, I do not lay this sin at your charge. I have taken it, removed it, and placed it on the one and only who can save my dear son, sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. Now you've heard there was a secret chord. I played my harp and it pleased the Lord. But you really don't care for my music, do you? It goes like this, Psalm 4th and 5th, my minor fall, the major lift. The baffled king composing, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Now, I've done my best, and it wasn't much. I couldn't feel. I couldn't touch. I didn't know the truth. I came just to fool you. And even though it all went wrong, I'll still stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. 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 Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this psalm. I thank you for the patience of your people over these last few weeks. I know it's been a different style, and God, I pray that all of these redramatizations from your word come to this climax that all of us are here because you forgave us. Remind us that we are spiritual Davids. We sin and do it well. We are, we are <laughs> accused, uh, condemned. We can't squirm and wiggle our way out of it. We, we are the men and women. And yet it is only because of you that we get off. It is only your declaration based on the work of your son. And God, whatever is happening on Lackman and beyond, and there is a lot of mess that's happening in our world, as your redeemed, your little bunch of band of Christians, we stand completely at peace, completely happy in a world that is going to hell in a handbasket quicker today than perhaps at every time in our life, we stand at total peace because we have been forgiven. That is our only hope, sweet Jesus. We pray this for those that are not here today, that are unbelieving family and friends and co-workers, that they would taste forgiveness that has completely removed our sin. And God, for those that are here today that are Christians but have a tendency to question your forgiveness because they like to look at their sin too much, would you please lovingly, gently correct them that they're looking at their sin too much and they're not looking at the cross enough? Because at the cross stands complete forgiveness, forgotten forever, and help them to emphasize the forever. And may we all stand around the throne someday, night and day, and sing hallelujah. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen.